Great, everybody. First, thanks to the amazing organizers of our medicine. Um, this has been quite an experience. Uh, there have been few, if any, technical glitches. Um, it's just awesome, so kudos to you all, thank you. I'm Travis Gerke, uh, I am Health Informatics Director and Scientific Director of Collaborative Data Services at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. I'll actually explain what those groups are in a couple moments. This is a co-presented talk with Garrick Aiden Bowie. Uh, so this will go as I'll talk through my slides, I'll finish, I'll hand off to him to, to wind things down. So since I don't own the last slide, I'll inject a couple of formalities here that I would usually talk over um, at the end. So first, you're about to see some really cool slides, um, and I can personally take credit for effectively none of them. Uh, those of you who know Garrick will know that he is really a community wizard and visionary among making Sharingan slides uh, really elegant and interactive and awesome. Um, so all, all the cool things you're about to see, I kind of whiteboarded a little bit, and then he just took it and ran from there. Um, so it's been a learning experience for me and a lot of fun. Second, we're hiring multiple positions at Moffitt uh, that I thought I would mention. Uh, we do have a specific eye always out for our developers and data scientists over the next few months. So do feel free to react, reach out to me after this um, if you want to come work with us. All right, so here we go. To orient you to the origin of this talk, um, where Garrick and I are coming from, um, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of organizational infrastructure uh, to those who are interested in building out these kinds of personnel resources and package resources. Um, and how it came to be that we gain high value from maintaining and developing an R package universe at our institution. I'll begin with a story which is based on Moffitt's experience, but really could represent any institution's data-related journey. Once upon a time, our organization conducted all data-related business in an amorphous cloud known as the IT department. This is a common paradigm for many healthcare organizations in the early stages of data maturity. The IT department had many roles. Hospital operations needed dashboards for planning purposes. IT had someone that could do that. Researchers needed patient or biospecimen data for their IRB approved protocols. IT also had somebody for that. Somebody, of course, needed to know about data lineage as well as coding or metadata standards, basically how the data got here and why it looks the way that it does. That was an IT. And organizing databases into a warehouse and granting access is, is of course, important. Uh, IT had somebody for that too. But eventually some of these teams were operating at a scale which would better be situated as an independent entity of the IT gravity field. One of these was business intelligence. That person who is making dashboards for operational, i.e. non-research stakeholders, is now part of a larger team that creates such products at scale. Next, our research-focused stakeholders had many of the same needs as the operational end users, such as reporting, dashboarding, and importantly, data provisioning. The twist, of course, in research space is that such activities must be conducted in accordance with IRB and ethical approval, and study design feasibility as it relates to data availability and structure requires specialized training, data science, biostatistics, epidemiology, and hence the, C the Collaborative Data Services team was formed. This is one of the groups that Garrick and I are representing here today. But Collaborative Data Services can't operate at scale in a vacuum either. A critical and complementary team, data and quality standards, formed from IT's data historian person. They ensure that data dictionaries are robust and data lineage is understood by the business intelligence and collaborative data services teams for appropriate downstream data usage. As institutional data assets grew, warehousing and access rules became necessarily complex. Data engineering formed a new continent within IT to meet the challenge. And now with so many teams completing data-related operations at a rapid pace, we needed a shuttlecraft to coordinate technology strategy, inform general data governance, and mine valuable software or from the Astar Roid belt. The dad joke, I know you're laughing. I'm, it, this virtual thing is hard. Um, Asteroid belt, get it. Um, <laughs> So that's the health informatics team. I spent a lot of time in that shuttlecraft making sure that the packages developed by people like Garrick make their way through the appropriate groups and shared among our institution. When these tools are ready for placement and maintenance in the institutionally supported production environment, the new applications development landmass of an IT can help out. For example, they maintain software such as RStudio Server or GitHub Enterprise. This whole story, admittedly with some shortcuts for clarity, mirrors the rise of the chief data officer role across healthcare industry. Indeed, all these groups tend to roll up or be horizontally aligned in some way with the CDO's vertical. Taken together, this is our first hint that scaling data provisioning isn't just about scaling data. It's about scaling the people who are doing the provisioning. 
In part two, Garrick is going to tell you more about the how. So as Travis talked about scaling provisioning by scaling systems of people, I'm going to talk about how we scale those people and their access to data systems through our packages. I'm going to start with an entirely hypothetical, but probably familiar story. It starts with a question. I want to connect our tissue sample inventory to a patient's clinical data. It's not something I've done before, so I'm not quite sure how to access the samples table or how to link a sample to a patient, but obviously it has to be possible, right? So how do I get started? Well, if you believe the big data stock photos, I go to the self-service data wall and point at the numbers that I want. In reality, it probably starts with an email or many emails. I start by reaching out to someone I know in data engineering who manages that particular data resource, and I see what they can tell me. Dear friendly data ops person, how can I connect our sample inventory to patient level clinical data? I've heard that you know the secret. Thanks, Garrick. I fire off the email and a little while later, I get a reply. Hey Garrick, here's the query we use to populate the table. Good luck. And look, the email came with an attachment that I can open up. And I'm immediately hit with a wall of SQL code. Okay, this query doesn't look pretty, but in a couple hours, I'll probably get the gist of it. And if I go looking in here, somewhere in here, there's probably some tables are referenced, a sample table, there's a patient table, there's a sample indicator. Okay, and these lines here, um, after a while of puzzling, I realized that they're about turning coded values into text labels. All right, fine. And hey, it's at least code, right? Well, since we're emailing files around, sometimes you'll get a query like this in a slightly different format, like a Word document, where the query doesn't really fit on the screen or the page. And let's just say formatting choices are fluid. So putting aside emailing in Word document format, SQL queries are not a great vehicle for knowledge transfer. They're good for precisely communicating data specifications in the robot language that databases understand, but we have other ways of working with data that have been specifically designed with humans in mind. For example, dplyr, whose API is very intentionally designed in line with the philosophy that code is written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. This reminds me of a great quote from Jenny Bryan that's, of course, someone has to write for loops. I mean, SQL code. It doesn't have to be you. So let's take a look at what this query might look like in an alternate universe. Here's the same query rewritten using a blend of dplyr and custom functions that support our particular setup. OK, let's walk through the code step by step and see what it represents. First of all, we call our universe the Moffatverse. Very much inspired by the tidyverse, a single library Moffatverse loads a common set of packages that we use for nearly every data request. Most of these packages come from the tidyverse, but we also include our own supporting package, Moffat CDS, specifically tailored to my team's workflow. This creates a common starting point for everyone on the team. It also gives us a formal on-ramp to install and set up database dependencies that we can leverage in specific packages that interface with our many backend systems. So this makes connecting to a specific database straightforward. You call use backend and the name of the database or server that you need to connect to, in this case, the fictional ABC database. Behind the scenes, this will load database specific packages, including a specific package for this resource called Moffat ABC. And each of these backend packages has two primary goals. The first is to simplify access. So by default, Moffat ABC will not only remember the incantations required to connect to the ABC database, but it'll actually manage the connection for users internally. It also provides easy access to tables with functions like ABC Tibble. Um, this kind of hides a bunch of other sort of less inviting dplyr code, and, um, and it manages the connection for the user, and it also connects uh, to tables in the ABC schema directly. So in this step, we find we connect to the three tables we need, samples, patients, and the sample indicators table. OK, at this point, we've set up our workspace and our environment, and we've connected to the tables that we need. So we can now focus on how these tables relate to each other, how we can get from samples to patients through a series of left joins. And finally, the final lines speak to the second goal of the backend specific packages, which is to wrap common, tedious, or error-prone database moves into standard functions. Here, because we're working in R, we have a lot more flexibility to write functions, use tidy select, tidy eval, and more. 
and to do things that would otherwise be very hard to do in SQL, like applying a not deleted filter to all of the tables used in the query or automatically looking up text labels of coded values. Okay, let's take a step back and reflect on this code as a whole. So it's really, it's not that this is fewer lines of code or less repetition or a question of R versus SQL, it's that this code does a much better job explaining to humans how the data is being collected and transformed. There's still plenty of assumptions here, but as we'll see, because these functions live in R packages, they bring a lot of context with them. So let's take a look at the source of the ABC choice replace function. Um, we've already seen that this function, uh, we've already seen that our naming conventions uh, at, communicate the function's intent, right? So we could read this like, and then um, replace the choices. But on top of that, the function name is chosen to aid discoverability. So in other words, a user can easily find other functions that operate on choice columns by exploring autocomplete and typing ABC underscore choice and seeing what other options are available. Because this function lives in an R package, we can document what the function does and why right next to the code. And the documentation is comfortably available right inside the data analysis environment. The body of the function can be consider considered technical documentation, recording how the function works. It's more precise than just a description of what best practices are. And we've learned that when interfacing with more technical teams, the function itself becomes specification for how we accomplish tasks, which makes it easy to say to engineering, this is what we do, or this is what the new platform needs to support. Taking another step back, uh, this function isn't just about making life easier for someone working with this data, we now see that it's a self-contained unit of knowledge. In this view, an R package isn't a place to keep code, it's where we store best practices or lessons learned. It's how you share that knowledge with others on your team. In fancy websites, seriously, R's tooling for package development is amazing. And it's tools like Package Down that, that make, they don't just make your code pretty and browsable and shareable and discoverable. Uh, they make your package documentation a viable knowledge repository and a place to turn when you need to learn something new. On top of this, if you're using version control front ends like GitHub or GitLab, you can also have a public place for sharing knowledge, asking questions, or getting help when things break down. Rather than sending emails that are only seen by the people copied in the email, you can open an issue where your question is seen by somebody else, answered publicly, available for future reference, and maybe becomes the basis of new functions and new functionality. So I'd like to close with a few practical tips about how to make this happen in your organization and teams. The first one is start small. Start with one team and make their lives better. I guarantee you that if you look for, look for it, you will find a painfully manual process just waiting for a hero like you. My second tip is to stay small. So rather than throwing everything into one big monolithic package that everybody uses, I've had success creating smaller, more focused packages. It gives me a little bit of freedom to experiment and also to make sure that I'm providing targeted solutions to the problem at hand. My next tip is to use vignettes. Vignettes are a great way to document and share processes that aren't easily captured in a single function or even in, an, in our code. Right. So I've used um, vignettes to document database driver setup and configuration or to show uh, how you would accomplish a whole game analysis from start to finish. And finally, be opinionated. OK, wait, wait, that came out wrong. Uh, provide a happy path. Consider that your users are likely used to a range of workflows. So help them fall into a pit of success by making sure the happy path is as smooth and as bump free as possible. None of this would be possible without a slew of packages and resources. Uh, key among these are use this and dev tools, which are great for package building, Roxygen 2, and package down for package documentation. If you're new to package building, R Hadley Wickham and Jen Jenny Bryan's R Packages book is a great place to start learning about R Packages, and it's an invaluable resource to turn to when you get stuck. We also used DRAT by Dirk Edelbutel to create an internal CRAN-like package repository, and it made package installation so much nicer and easier for our users. Um, and another option there is also our studio's package manager. And finally, a big shout out to Mike Kearney's Packageverse template that make, made it really easy to pull all of our packages into a, a cohesive unit and, um, and to create something uh, 
a, a fraction as cool as the tidyverse um, ourselves. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to say thank you for, uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk about our experience building packages. And I'll leave it here. I mean, I could talk about this for a long time, but thank you for the opportunity. And um, you can find Travis and I online um, if you'd like to talk more about this. Otherwise, I wish you the best of luck building your own universe of R packages and happy R users. I'm seeing questions. I could answer some. <laughs> I thought a moderator would jump back in. Um, lots of questions about the slides. Uh, Garrett, can you want to take that? How do we make them? Yeah, so uh, Sharingan. There's a the package Sharingan is the is what I use to make the slides, and then a lot of um, extra HTML and CSS. A lot of slide crafting, I call it. Thank you. While I'm browsing the questions, if I could pick one more from Peter. <laughs> Um, do your data managers like to randomly change names of tables and fields in the mood strikes? Um, that's a great question. Um, and that is why we have two teams that are complementary in this regard. Um, the data engineering team that I mentioned, and then the health informatics team, which has a, a governance function where we make sure that we approve any kind of table names that happen, uh, name changes that happen and field names that change. Um, we make sure that gets vetted appropriately. Hey, Travis, um, another question. How do you guys get over the learning curve to introduce people to functions? So I'll, I'll take that. I think um, I think definitely as a package developer, you have two people, maybe two or three people in mind. You have first the very new users who are going to use your functions, and um, and I, I see my role as sort of um, I do a lot of watching over other people's shoulders and seeing how they uh, approach a problem, how they how they tend to code with that. And then um, often I start to see patterns emerge between how one person is doing one thing and another person is doing this thing. And um, I guess by having those conversations, then I start to think, okay, well, we could build this into a function. Um, and so maybe I'm, you know, in a way, a curator of these processes. Um, but then this is also something that you could eventually train your users to, to write them themselves as well. Okay, great. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, it well question or a comment. Uh, it would be interesting to see how you handle huge data sets in the packages. Any sense of that? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, so we, we often we write packages that connect to databases and, um, and rather than than putting large data sets in those, those packages. Um, there's a lot of value in that, though, because we find that basically every database has its own quirks, its own weird way of storing the data, the you know one or two things that you need to know about that database to, to use it. And the packages are awesome way to sort of document that knowledge. OK, great. Thanks, guys. That was great. It was a really great talk. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Travis. OK, I will end this session then and uh, move people over to the next.